conducting research beneath, beside, and across the oceans. And I'm pleased to present to you five faculty here from Michigan State University. And in case you don't know, the whole point of Sharper Focus Wider Lens is to bring the expertise of our faculty to the community and students so that you can learn about some of the interesting research going on on campus and continue the conversations. When we bring in experts from other universities and other parts of the world, they're in for a day or two and they're gone and you don't get to follow up. Well, with Sharper Focus Wider Lens, you get access to these experts anytime you want and their schedule permits. And so with that, I want to introduce to you our first panelist today. Dr. Masako Taminago is an assistant professor in the Department of Geological Sciences. And she has logged over 450 days on the ocean, conducting research on 11 different research expeditions since 2002. Her research interests cover a wide area of geodynamic processes of the Earth, including mag magmatism, volcanism, and lithosphere evolution. Dr. Taminago? Yep. Well, thank you for a nice introduction. Um, so I'm a marine geophysicist in training. I usually look at the seafloor that covers 70% of Earth's surface and use that seafloor as a window to look at what kind of um, activity is going on on this planet Earth. So this seafloor is formed at mid-ocean ridge, which is um, a mountain range um, across the, all over the um, world ocean basins. Sorry, it's not working. Oh, yeah, please. Our, um, so this is a two really contrasting maps of the um, ocean, or say seafloor. So left-hand side diagram showing a 15th century view of ocean, and the right-hand side is the 21st century view of ocean. So nowadays, when we click the Google Earth, we can zoom in and then obtain quite detailed information about um, seafloor morphology, where the little sea mounts are, etc., etc. However, from um, our view changed from 15th century to 21st century, because, mainly because of the te uh, marine technology or marine engineering development. So that's what I would like to talk about today, how, to, how we have been gaining the information of seafloor. So the most distinctive difference to obtain the information from land surface uh, versus ocean surface is basically on land we can see the features. It's tangible, you know, geology is tangible. However, when, for example, this lava flow, red, um, uh, red the color on the left-hand side map, showing the lava flow from the uh, Kilauea volcano in Hawaii, and when this lava flow, we're flowing on land, we can map the direction of the lava flow. However, when it reached to the shore, shoreline, which is the right-hand side photo, and it goes down into underneath the water, we cannot basically see where this lava flow goes. So how can we obtain this information underwater? So late, even late 19th century, we were using, well, people were using this uh, big lead ball sounding system, so uh, cruising on the sailing boat and dropping this lead ball, attached the piano wire, and then counting the distance of this piano wire to basically measure the depth of the ocean. And the left-hand side um, diagram is showing the best bathymetry, ocean depth map we could have back in 19th century by dropping these lead balls. And early 20th century, finally, the ship engineering became a little bit more modern, uh, using not only the uh, sailing and ma sails and mast, but um, the charcoals and 
uh, some time later, uh, actually, um, hydrocarbon fuel, uh, somebody come up with, oh, why don't we just basically um, sending the sound, ping sound from the ship, and then receiving that sound reflecting back from the seafloor, and calculate the distance from the ship to the seafloor. After World War II, well, during World War II and after World War II, this, um, these people, two, mainly two people, um, the left, left hand side gentleman called um, uh, Bruce Heason, and then the right hand side lady, she is a really famous geophysicist, uh, marine, and the first uh, woman geophysicist in our community, named um, Marie Thorpe. And both are at Columbia University up in New York, uh, New York State. And they compiled thousands of thousands of sounding data to make the seafloor map. This map is a first published um, publicly available physiography of the seafloor, world seafloor, um, done by these two people and drawn by the cartographer from um, National Geographic in seven, uh, 1973. So it's not, you know, it's not, it's not the old thing. This is quite recent, okay? And nowadays, we have a very accurate GPS. Therefore, global scale ocean floor is mapped by satellite data. So using the ba very basic um, so-called gravity anomaly uh, analysis, we can convert gravity anomaly measured by satellite, uh, Chris, you know, kind of flying over the orbit of Earth, convert into the very detailed seafloor morphology. So this is, again, publicly available, very detailed seafloor map. Now, we can obtain probably one mile per, uh, one mile versus one mile accurate, accuracy um, map with the satellite data. However, if you want to go into more detailed observation, we still would like to use the shipboard data and the sounding system from the ship. So used to be we only could send the one ping, sound ping down and then back. However, nowadays we can probably send uh, as um, many as 96 ping at the same time. So almost we can scan the along the track seafloor by ship as well as underwater vehicles. And under, using the underwater vehicle, we can um, get down to very close to the seafloor, uh, obtaining much, much accurate and high resolution data. And left hand side is uh, scientific community can use this uh, so-called century autonomous underwater vehicle. This yellow uh, robot can swim by itself. We don't need to control um, from the uh, taser, electrical taser or anything. And on the other hand, the right hand side, a little bit darker uh, photographs, I apologize. But this uh, right hand side vehicle calls um, remotely operated, operated vehicle, ROV Jason 2, which has a manipulate, uh, manipulator, so the hands to grab the sample from the seafloor. And here is a fascinating fact that CB, um, this is exact, the, um, acoustically detected ocean floor morphology um, by different kind of sonar system. CBM 12 kilohertz, the left hand, left most, uh, left hand side diagram is the uh, 30 years ago, what we thought this is the morphology. And EM300 system, which is equipped on the, any research vessel right now, this is what we can nominally understand what's on the seafloor. However, if we use the underwater vehicles, robots, send down to very close to the seafloor and then obtain the data from exact same spot, that's the right hand side, image, map, image next um, 675 kilohertz data, 
how different are they, right? Then ultimately, we want to see what's down there by our eyes. And here is a, a human-occupied vehicle, um, Alvin. This can dive into uh, up to this 4,500 meter. And actually, scientists can look into what is you know, on, uh, covering the seafloor by our own eyes. Now, it's really great to have the detailed view of seafloor, but this technological development and um, establishment of a detailed seafloor map actually start raising um, other kind of questions. So the, um, who's or the message uh, from my talk tonight would be, who's, we should think about who's ocean or seafloor. So there is a uh, uh, United Nations uh, deter dis actually decided that declared that in 1970s that um, ex outside of the so-called the um, eco extended economic zone, international water is nobody's ocean or say everybody's ocean. It is the um, um, our uh, heritage. However, recently, because of this um, technological development, we can uh, redefine the um, extension of our own property. And each country became extremely eager to get new maps to claim and extend <coughs> our own land. So this is the, uh, you, uh, one of the US effort around the Mariana Trench, around the Guam, trying to figure out what is the extension of this tiny island in the southern um, uh, Western Pacific to redefine the uh, US ocean territory. And then moreover, another uh, significant question uh, we are actually encountering right now is that from uh, satellite data, we cannot see the detail of the seafloor. However, from the ship data, this is what seafloor looks like. And then further, if we use the vehicle and dive down, this type of so-called hydrothermal system, the living uh, chimney system in place on the seafloor, uh, particularly along the Mid-Ocean Ridge, have been found. And the <laughs> economical value of this um, so, uh, chimney are huge. Scientists found that precious metal concentration of precious, precious metals, such as gold, silver, copper, zinc, are much, much high in this type of chimney compared to the land mining, uh, land mines. Therefore, right now, exactly same under United Nations. Um, there is a so-called International Seabed Authority that can authorize any company from any country to claim the seafloor mining in international water. So right now, we have the French uh, company, for example, in the orange on the right-hand side, is digging the, everybody's seafloor off the India. So again, who's ocean, who's the seafloor? We don't know, but this is the result of the development of technology, I must say. Okay. Great. Sorry, it's over, sorry. Thank you very much, Dr. Taminago. And, and this is interesting because it sets the stage as the ocean and the ocean floor as a boundary that we're still trying to figure out who owns. And, and so when you talk about geopolitics and establishing the oceans as as some form of mass that governments want to control. And next we're going to hear from Dr. Nathaniel Ostrom, who is a professor in the Department of Zoology. And his research focuses on the application of stable isotopes and other approaches for understanding the bio-geochemical cycling of carbon and nitrogen in a variety of ecosystems. He's worked in the Gulf of Mexico on researching hypoxia and the effects of deep water horizon oil spill on their growth. Thank you. 
Well, I'm going to talk about uh, two gases today, uh, oxygen and nitrous oxide, that have been the focus of my research for at least 10 years, perhaps longer. And I'm going to talk about them in the context of two ecosystems, two rather contrasting ecosystems, Lake Vita in the dry valleys of Antarctica, which is actually six times saltier than seawater, so it's quite appropriate for this venue. Uh, and I'll also talk about the northern Gulf of Mexico, where we have done some research on the uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill. First, I just uh, summarize the, the general characteristics about these gases. They, you might initially think they are quite different, and indeed they are, but there are some interesting similarities or interesting ways they interact with one another. Um, uh, we're breathing about one-fifth of what we breathe right now is oxygen gas. Nitrous oxide is present at much, much lower levels, 320 parts per billion, so a tiny fraction. Um, Oxygen has a little role in global warming, but nitrous oxide actually causes 6% of the human-induced global warming. So it's a very important player in the greenhouse gas uh, business. Uh, oxygen gas is also very important because when it gets up into the stratosphere, uh, it reacts with uh, cosmic rays to generate ozone, which protects us from harmful UV rays. Uh, nitrous oxide, in contrast, is the primary mechanism by which ozone is destroyed in the stratosphere. So it actually just replaced CFCs uh, a couple of years, years ago. Both are biogenic. They're both produced by, by life. Oxygen is clearly critical for multicellular life and probably was critical in the evolution of multicellular life once it reached a high level. Uh, and the way they're interconnected because once the environment becomes depleted in oxygen, that produces the conditions that are ripe for N2O production, for nitrous oxide production. <clears throat> Now I'm going to talk about uh, Lake Vida, which is located in the McMurdo Dry Valleys. Um, this is an area which is not uh, covered by glacial ice, and it actually is a desert environment. It receives very little precipitation, so we have an extremely cold desert. There are several small lakes that are located in the dry valleys, uh, all of which are permanently covered by ice. Uh, many, most of which actually support photosynthesis. So there is plant growth. Most have very high salinities, as we'll see. Some have very high levels of nutrients, and many actually lack oxygen or are anoxic on the bottom. And they've been a real interest to scientists in the past 10, 15 years as an analogies for how life could exist in extreme environments, especially when we look to the colder uh, planets or moons in our solar system. <coughs> Lake Vida is located in Victoria Valley, it, uh, is, is, which is one of the colder valleys. Uh, the lake is rather small, although it is the largest of the Dry Valley lakes at seven square kilometers. Uh, and it was initially thought to be just a chunk of ice, and so it was largely ignored. Uh, however, three expeditions have now demonstrated that there is indeed brine or water in the bottom of the lake. Um, <coughs> these are the profiles for of ice drills that were taken in Lake, Lake Vida in 96, 2005, and most recently in 2010, which was the expedition I participated in. And you can see that they penetrated uh, to a depth of about 16, 18 uh, meters, and at a depth of about 18 meters in the ice, uh, water began to infill the, the hole and actually rose up the hole, which is shown in orange, to a height of 10 meters. Uh, and it's that water that we actually sampled. And we don't really think that this is a body of water. We think that it is so cold but so salty that it is a slushy kind of a brine. And one of the things that happened in the 2005 expedition is they wanted to keep drilling to find the bottom of the lake, or at least penetrate to a body of water, and then they encountered more ice, they encountered more sediment, more ice, more sediment, and then the drill string got stuck, and it's still there. So <laughs> this is a very different environment. <laughs> Now this is uh, showing a picture of Vida and the actual team while they were drilling. Again, there's about 20 meters of ice covering the lake, and on the right is a profile of the ice, and you can see that within the ice there are, sediment, there are several sediment layers, and there's also a couple of microbial mats. And one of the microbial mats at a depth of 12 meters was sampled, and it has a C14 date of about 2,700 years, which means the brine in the lake has been isolated from the atmosphere for at least 2,700 years, probably longer. And that mat, microbial mat was viable. They took it out and they put it in water and gave it nutrients and it grew. Uh, so, uh, and so what we really wanted to know was what's going on in the brine? Uh, are the microbes there active? Um, and also we really wanted to understand the very unusual uh, geochemistry of the brine. And this is just a, a very 
quick summary of the geochemistry of the brine. Um, it is exceptionally cold, minus 13 and a half degrees centigrade, which is a little bit warmer than your freezer. Uh, and it is still salty, or still liquid at those temperatures because it has a salinity that's six times out of seawater. So a typical salinity of seawater is 35, and this is at 188 or 200. Uh, so it's really one of the coldest cryobiospheres. It has um, exceptionally high levels of iron, uh, which is why the containers that are shown in the picture there are orange, because it is very high in iron. And as soon as that water interacts with oxygen in the atmosphere, it starts to precipitate iron out. It also has exceptionally high concentrations of inorganic nitrogen, so nitrate, ammonium, nitrite. The levels of nitrite are actually toxic to most organisms on Earth. If, if you had those levels of nitrite in your fish tank, your fish would not be very happy. It also has the highest concentration of nitrous oxide ever reported for an aquatic environment. And of course, that intrigued me to no end, and I had to find out what is forming this nitrous oxide. Now, to make a long story short, we did indeed find a microbial community in the brine, it is, uh, and it was viable. We were able to take the microbes out and grow them at uh, temperatures of minus 13 and a half degrees, but also at room temperature. And we have shown that those microbes are actually capable of producing nitrous oxide. However, we don't think they're very active. All the evidence we have is that they're really just crawling along at a very, very slow pace, pace because it's so darn cold. But it is a viable ecosystem. So I don't think the nitrous oxide is actually formed by that. We think it's formed by a reaction between the nitrite and the iron, uh, such that it produces nitrous oxide via a reaction called serpentinization. And serpentinization is really a suite of reactions between nutrients in water and iron minerals in rocks. And nitrous oxide is just one of the compounds that produce in this reaction. Hydrogen gas is also produced. And actually, organic compounds are produced. And we think that serpentinization was an early process that generated organic matter on Earth and may have helped create the organic soup on Earth from which life evolved. And so we have a microcosm here today of a reaction that occurred you know, millions of years ago, actually several billion years. So now I'm going to jump gears and talk about hypoxia and the lack of oxygen or low levels of oxygen in the northern Gulf of Mexico. And hypoxia is defined in the oceans as a concentration of oxygen less than 2 ppm. 8 to 10 ppm would be typical. And it's at that level that organisms start to show stress or in some cases actually perish. And hypoxia in the northern Gulf of Mexico was first observed in 1972, and the right panel shows you uh, three years, uh, which it was studied going from 93 to 95. So it waxes and wanes a little bit. It uh, has mon been monitored consistently since 1985. Uh, it has a maximum size uh, observed in 2002 at 22,000 square kilometers, which is about the size of the state of New Jersey. So this is a very, very large area. It disappears in winter due to mixing by storms, and then it reestablishes in the spring and persists until September or October. Now, what causes it? The, it very likely was a natural feature of the northern Gulf of Mexico, but it certainly has gotten a lot worse. And a number of government agencies have concluded that hypoxia in the northern Gulf of Mexico was caused primarily by the excess nitrogen delivered from the Mississippi Atchafalaya rivers. So we know that the fertilizer we apply to fields enhances plant growth. Ha about half of the fertilizer we apply to fields actually washes off and gets into the rivers and eventually into the ocean, and it stimulates plant growth there. Uh, nitrate load in the Mississippi has increased 300% between 1950 to 1990, but the stream flow has only increased by 30%. So we can't explain the increase in nitrogen loading from an increase in stream flow. Interestingly, that increase in stream flow is a function of global warming and increased precipitation. <clears throat> now, the number of dead zones around the world, these are also called dead zones. I don't like to use that name because there are microbes who are quite happy and without oxygen, such as in Lake Vita. <laughs> uh, the number of dead zones has actually been doubling every decade since the 1960s. So the bar in the graph is showing you the increase in uh, observed dead zones around the world. The bottom figure is showing you where those have been identified. And my guess is that's not a comprehensive list because I think there's a lot of places we're just not looking. Um, over 400 systems, over 245,000 square kilometers, only 4% are showing signs of recovery. So this is a problem that's only getting worse. <clears throat> now what causes hypoxia? Again, it's in nitrogen loading, 
causes a chain of events. It stimulates plant growth in the ocean, just like it causes corn to grow. The plants gradually, eventually die. They settle to the bottom, and as they're decomposing, oxygen is consumed. Uh, and so that's basically what causes that. <clears throat> um, now, we were prepared to study nitrogen cycling in the hypoxic zone in, in early 2010. We actually had a research cruise scheduled for May of 2010, and then the Deepwater Horizon oil spill happened one month before our cruise was scheduled to go. And our first reaction was, oh gosh, this is a disaster, it's gonna ruin our study. Uh, but then on the other hand, we started thinking, well, maybe there's an opportunity here. So we know that it was initially, uh, it, uh, it was capped on July 15. It was the worst uh, marine oil disaster in the U.S. Uh, what's interesting is the amount of carbon added from the oil was roughly equivalent, equivalent to how much carbon that is grown by plants in that area. So we really loaded the system with organic carbon. Mm -hmm. This is, we quickly wrote a grant to the National Science Foundation to study the impact of the oil spill on hypoxia. And there's a great program called RAPID that doesn't take the six months to review um, that, that you need if you want to study a disaster. So within two weeks, you can actually get funded, and we did. This shows you where we studied and where the oil spill was. And this is just going to run you through some of the oxygen profiles. This is showing you one station where in yellow is where the hypoxia is. And you can see that on the right there where the bottom water is just starting to become hypoxic. At the next station, you can see maybe barely hypoxic in May, but certainly hypoxic in, uh, in August. And uh, the hypoxia really is close to the bottom. It doesn't always extend straight to the surface. Um, so this run you quickly through these. This again, also see hypoxia in August. This is an offshore station and you don't see hypoxia, but you don't usually see hypoxia where the water is deep. Where we were surprised to see hypoxia is station CT east of the Mississippi River. That was a control station and it historically doesn't go hypoxic and yet we found mm -hmm. hypoxia there. So really the question is, is this any way related to the oil spill? <clears throat> well, we know that nitrogen loading from the Mississippi River triggers the blooms and eventually the, the dead zone. And in fact, you can predict the size of the dead zone from the amount of nitrogen loading in May. And that year, the scientists predicted an area of 20,140 square kilometers. What they actually observed was 20,000 square kilometers. So the dead zone was about the size that they predicted from nitrogen loading alone without having to invoke any influence from the oil spill. So they concluded there was no role. Um, I'm not so sure. Uh, this is showing you on the bottom the map of the survey. The hypoxia is in orange and red. And uh, you notice on the left that they stopped off the Texas shelf and didn't keep going. But there clearly was hypoxia there. There's also, we know that two storms passed through the dead zone right before, which actually is, is where it's orange, and that added oxygen to the water. And we found hypoxia east of the Mississippi River where they weren't looking for it. Uh, so I basically would conclude that we don't really know. Uh, and there's still a good possibility. But if you really want to solve the problem with the dead zone, you shouldn't be worried about the oil spill. We need to worry about the nitrogen loading. And I'll end there, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ostrom, and, and it's interesting to see how important it is to really pay attention to ecosystems in general, and this was a good example of science in action, right? There, there's a problem that happens, and how do we respond to it in such a way that we can take our knowledge base and make a difference and really figure out what's going on. And so we've had two presenters that help us really understand the natural environment of water, ocean, salt-based water systems, and we're going to transition a little bit and think about then what does the impact mean in terms of humanity and relationships of that nature. And so Dr. Peter Beatty is an associate professor in the Department of History, and he works within the history of the Atlantic world. And it features studies of the linkages across the Atlantic Ocean, especially between Africa, South America, and the Caribbean. And his research specifically focuses on 19th and early 20th century Brazil. And he examines the interaction between the poor, including the enslaved, and state institutions. Dr. Beatty. Thank you. Um, pleasure to be here tonight. Thanks, everybody, for coming out in this cold, cold evening in Michigan. Um, I'm going to talk about Atlantic history tonight. Um, I've just finished a book on an island in the middle of the Atlantic called Fernando de Noronha, which in the 19th century was the largest uh, penal colony uh, for Brazil. So I'm going to start 
with a little bit of an antidote, zooming in and then zoom back out to talk about what Atlantic history is and, and a question I attempt to answer in this manuscript. In the American Frank Carpenter's 1884 novel, Roundabout Rio, the narrator observes that slaves in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, were aware that a slow process of abolition was afoot, and they had become idle with impunity because they knew that their master's instruments of torture were destined for a museum shelf. The narrator claims that in the interior, Brazilian overse overseers treated plantation slaves with brutality, but mistreated slaves often murdered their overseers in revenge and in the same act, bettered their lives because capital punishment did not exist in the Brazils. Instead, quote, the murderer is transported to the penal colony on the island of Fernando de Noronha. But since the convict's work is lighter and his fare is better than the slaves, his last state is better than the first. In this ocean resort, the slave sees a premium for crime. And in consequence, a man might as well be a tax gatherer in Ireland as an overseer in Brazil." Unquote. Carpenter's off-the-cuff comparative sociology of oppression inflated the dangers faced by overseers in Brazil and, for that matter, tax collectors in Ireland. But he reveals a broad Atlantic perspective on human rights, one that's very comparative. The image of impunity for slave convicts in Fernando de Noronha's penal colony had become a part of a Brazilian masterclass folklore that an American author used to draw dubious moral equivalencies between two empires dealing with uh, restive subjugated populations. Many Brazilians blamed their monarch, Pedro II, for what they depicted as a rising tide of homicidal slave violence against masters and slaves. They argued that their emperor had eliminated the only deterrent to slave assassins when in 1876, he began to commute all death sentences to life imprisonment, even for slaves who killed their masters. This antidote about a penal colony some 200 miles off Brazil's coast, where slave convicts were allegedly coddled, led me to ask a question well suited to the subfield of Atlantic history. Why was Brazil one of the first nations to abolish the death penalty, while it was the last to abolish slavery in the Western Hemisphere in 1888. So what is Atlantic history? Um, oh, I went, went too far. Uh, I think the British historian John Eliot described it well when he called it the study of the creation, destruction, and recreation of communities as a result of the movement across and around the Atlantic basin of people, commodities, cultural practices, and values. This subfield arose about 30 years ago in reaction against histories bounded by national and imperial borders and chronologies. Atlantic historians sought to study this oceanic basin as more of a unit and a conduit than a barrier to these exchanges of people, goods, and ideas, which began roughly in the 15th and ended in the 19th century with the rise of nation states and the end of slavery. Atlantic history was a crucible of great inhumanity. Witness the massive transatlantic slave trade, episodes of genocide, but it was also where the idea of human rights and citizenship emerged. So one question well suited to an Atlantic history perspective is why human rights emerged with great moral and political force in the 19th century. And within that question, my smaller question was why Brazil was the last to tolerate slavery, but among the first to abolish the death penalty. And I don't think I'll shock anybody here by arguing that the answer lies in history. OK. Uh, the Portuguese empire was, oh, thanks. You That's probably twice. better. I keep clicking twice. Uh, the Portuguese empire was immense. Long before Great Britain, the Portuguese had established an empire where the sun never set, stretching from Macau to the hinterlands of Brazil. But there was a problem. Uh, Portugal had a relatively small population compared to its European rivals, not to mention the large indigenous populations that inhabited its colonial territories. So it's not surprising that the Portuguese had to be creative and develop three different coercive migratory labor systems in order to people and develop its colonial possessions around the world. The first and most important in the case of Brazil, of course, is African slavery. It's estimated that nearly two in five slaves in the transatlantic slave trade went to Brazil. Indigenous slaving was also important to the development of Brazil, but perhaps the most neglected was penal transportation, where Portugal was a pioneer. 
Portuguese courts sentenced convicts specifically to be exiled to targeted colonial territories. Convicts had always been an important part of the cutting edge of Portuguese expansion. Portuguese navigators knew it was very dangerous to get off the boat if you did not know the native populations or speak their languages. So they always carried with them a collection of convicts that they strategically marooned on the coasts of the Americas, Africa, and Asia in the hopes that a few would survive, be integrated into the local communities, and most importantly, learn the customs and languages. So when the Portuguese came back, they would have these important go-betweens that they could negotiate with, and they called them after their most important appendage to them, linguas or tongues. So Portugal, because of its small population, tended to recycle its convicts, whereas other more populous empires like Britain sent them more happily and readily to the gallows. Okay, this chart just briefly shows the, oh, thank you. <laughs> Can I count on you for that? Uh, the sort of avant-garde position of Portugal in abolishing the death penalty, it legally does it in 1867, but it hadn't bothered to execute any of its citizens for two decades before that, so there was actually de facto abolition before that. And similarly, in the case of Brazil, in 1876, the emperor de facto ends the death penalty, and I'll talk a little bit about why there's a de jure or, de jure or legal end to the practice a little bit later. Well, the Portuguese used some of the same techniques to settle this island uh, in the middle of the Atlantic, Fernando de Noronha in the 1730s, and it populated it with convicts and soldiers from Brazil. So when Brazil won its independence from Portugal and established a constitutional monarchy, um, it claimed Fernando de Noronha and continued to people it with its own convicts and soldiers. Brazil would end the transatlantic slave trade in 1850, due mostly to British pressure, um, and this was important because Brazil's slave population had never naturally reproduced itself, so it quickly declines. In 1850, 30% of Brazil's inhabitants were enslaved. Already by 1872, that percentage was half, down to 15%. It's also in this decade that Emperor Pedro II comes to the power and he's opposed to both slavery and the death penalty and he begins to commute sentences. So more and more of these slave convicts show up on Fernando de Noronha and begin to cause controversy among those who support slavery. In the 1860s, Brazil was at war with its neighbor when it got an important missive from the lights of France. Important French politicians and intellectuals wrote the emperor urging him to do something about ending slavery. You gotta remember, in 1865, Brazil became the last independent nation in the Americas to tolerate slavery, and they were very sensitive about how this made Brazil look internationally. The emperor was related to most of the royalty in Europe, and he corresponded regularly with intellectuals across Europe. So he had his cabinet write a letter promising these French dignitaries that they would do something after the war was over, and he came through on his promise. In 1871, Parliament passed a free womb law that said that no one could be born a slave any longer in Brazil. But theoretically, another generation of slave, slaves could have lived in Brazil. The problem for the emperor was this. Um, it took an act of Parliament to end slavery, and there were too many representatives in Parliament that supported the right to slave labor. However, his constitutional powers allowed him to commute or pardon convicts convicted by Brazil's courts. So after a visit to Victor Hugo in the mid-1870s, the emperor came back and resolved that he would not um, allow anyone else to be legally executed in Brazil. If Brazil couldn't be first in ending slavery, it could be among the first to end the death penalty in the world. In 1888, Parliament finally abolishes slavery. A year later, an army coup throws the emperor out, sends him into exile, and a republic is promulgated. But what's important about this is that this republican government puts the law abolishing the death penalty into the Constitution. This shows that support for this measure wasn't limited to the emperor, it was shared by his opposition. So there was a broad base of support, and it's uh, something that Brazil has cleaved to to this day. Oh, can you move that one for Okay. So, uh, as I've argued, Portuguese legal traditions played a role in Brazil's uh, attitudes toward the death penalty. Another important factor was the slow but comparatively peaceful abolition of slavery in Brazil. It was piecemeal and slow. Uh, third, it was a very centralized system where the emperor was able to use his powers to abolish slavery, and then a central republican government 
made the de jure uh, obligation, and something that doesn't seem related, but Brazil had a population that was majority non-white, about 40% of Brazilians were white, but there is no laws for segregation in Brazil, and instead of fearing race mixture, the Brazilian elites embraced it, along with European immigration, as a way of whitening Brazil's population. So I'm gonna make a brief comparison with the United States, just for some contrast here. Of course, as I've established, the British used the death penalty much more liberally for a wide variety of crimes, um, any, some, some even quite petty, and we inherited that tradition here in the United States and continue to use it very liberally against slaves. Slaves could be executed in the U.S. South for rape or for theft even, um, including insurrection murder. In Brazil, slaves were only executed for insurrection or murder, never for more minor crimes. Of course, the Civil War ended slavery in a spectacularly violent cataclysm. Um, and of course, after Reconstruction, Bourbon Democrats took power through a reign of terror that was in part through extra-legal lynchings and also legal executions by the court. This was the way they took power from African Americans and their Republican allies in the South. Of course, this supported uh, Jim Crow segregation laws that were put in place in the 1890s. And of course, North and South, there was extreme fear of race mixture in the United States. Of course, one of the excuses to lynch black men, mostly, was that they had raped, attempted to rape, or seduce white women. So um, this was a, a tension in uh, American society that these traditions gave rise to. Finally, federalism meant that the battle against the death penalty would be fought state by state in the United States, the great state of Michigan being the first and foremost to abolish the death penalty in 1846. So with this brief case study, I just want to say two final things. Um, this brief comparison shows how empires and nations in the 19th century not only competed in arms races to dominate territory, trade routes, people, and resources, but they also competed in what we might call a human rights race, or as historian Christopher Brown terms it, a race to accumulate moral capital. It also indicates that different colonial heritages of the United States and Brazil and the different paths they took toward abolition shaped different attitudes toward the death penalty in both nations. Thank you. So Dr. Beatty takes us from the concept of oceans as physical spaces that we should be concerned with to what actually transpires across oceans and the geopolitics that occurs and, and the international dimensions and really brings us to think about how many nations created penal colonies you know, plopped in the middle of the ocean, thinking, okay, well, these people can't get off and they can't get back to us, and so we've essentially separated ourselves from the ne'er-do-wells. And so what does that mean about how we function in society? And we're gonna kind of continue with that theme about geopolitics and concern with, with larger issues in terms of how we interact with the environment around us and with people with Dr. Gail Vanderstoop. She's an associate professor in the Department of Community, Agriculture, Recreation, and Resource Studies, which is actually um, going to be a new name as of July 1st, which I don't remember. Community Sustainability. Community Sustainability. <laughs> so we'll just go ahead and put that out there. And she has national and international experience in interpretive communications applied to historic, natural, and cultural resources, and in the context of museums, parks, zoos, aquariums, nature centers, and other informal learning centers tourism experiences, and as a part of community development. And so how do we come to understand and interact with the resources around us? Thank you. And I will give a nod to <laughs> the people of the Federated States of Micronesia, not traditional outfit, but certainly typical in post-European contact period. We're jumping from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean now, and I'll build a little on sort of everybody's presentations. Yours, um, Masako, because of rights and responsibilities of ownership of ocean lands. Yours, um, Nathaniel, because of the impacts of human actions on land and how it affects the waters around them. Yours, because of dealing with other nations who tend to use islands for all sorts of purposes. 
and yours because we have a nod to climate change. So with that, again, we're looking at the, the new nation state of the Federated States of Micronesia, which is comprised of four independent autonomous states, but they ha are grouped together in a federation and they became independent as of 1983. I guess this was probably like the second big independence and have been funded by the United States under a compact of free association from 83 to 2003. They were not economically independent yet and so are now funded for an additional 23 years. So it's been incumbent up upon them to develop a plan to move forward as an economically independent nation or interdependent nation instead of relying entirely on the U.S. So with that as a background about why we're working there, let's get, get a little perspective. The state we've been working with the most frequently or the most intensely recently out of the almost 10 years we've been working there is the island of Ponape or the, the state of Ponape. And to give you some perspective on Ponape, if you look at that in the global context, you see that they truly are entirely surrounded by seawater. They are just north of Papua New Guinea and south of Guam. And to give a little more perspective, the Federated States of Micronesia spread about 1,700 miles from east to west, and the water area is incredibly larger than the land area. The entire Federated States of Micronesia comprise 607 islands with just over 270 square miles of land, but well over a million square miles of water. And that gets into the exclusive economic zone that Masako was talking about. Ponape, the one state that we've been working on in a focused way, has about 151,000 square miles of water and only 133 square miles of land. To give you some context for how that compares with the United States, if you were to overlay the EEZ of Federated States of Micronesia on the U.S., it's almost the same area as the um, continental U.S. And the population, entire population of FSM is about 107,000, almost 35,000 for Ponape. Not very many people. So you can imagine that a, a place that small in population but that huge in land is in quite a unique position. So the project that we're working on is to help them do strategic developments um, for a sustainable economy, but also a sustainable resource base, sustainable culture, sustainable traditions, et cetera. And, and we're approaching this through the perspective of a world park, which is identifying the entire nation as a world park so that the values of park, <coughs> which is managing lands, resources, based on values that are associated with special places and special resources. But it's also a place where people live. It's not bounding a place and saying all the people get out. And in trying to work with this, identity of the people is really, really important. And that as we were working with them just in the last year, I raised a question, well, what about something about your fishing villages? And they looked at me sort of like I was a really crazy person and said, we don't have fishing villages. Everybody fishes. Everybody is connected with fish. And everybody eats fish. It's just part of who we are as a people. So there aren't fishing villages and other kinds of villages. So that really brought it home to me that they are truly identified by water and their relationship. So principles of planning for this island nation, we have insisted that we're not using an expert model and that it will be Pompeian and Micronesian driven, that it will be multi-sector even though we're going at it through a tourism door as an economic generator. All the sectors have to be involved, health, education, culture, infrastructure, agriculture, as well as fisheries. As well, all of these sectors need to be integrated in their planning and realize the impacts and interrelationships one upon the other. There's also a need because of the his history of their own social structures to 
work with both the traditional leaders and the elected leadership because even though the elected leadership is the official leadership, there's a lot of power and influence tied up in traditional power base and leadership. So that becomes an important piece. Another factor is blending local and traditional knowledge with scientific best practices as well as with global impacts, and there are many of them. So in this arena, salt water, the ocean that is surrounding the people of Micronesia certainly defines them as a culture. It frames their entire worldview, and it also poses some interesting challenges for us in working with them on long-term strategic planning, and we'll explore some of these. And to understand that, you have to know a little bit about the history of the people. The Micronesians, as many of the Polynesians throughout the Pacific, were expert navigational people, expert sailing people, and they didn't just stay stuck on their own islands. They traveled and moved around over enormous areas, reading the waters, the wind and its impacts, the currents, birds that were flying in certain areas. So they really used the oceans and the currents and their knowledge of that environment to move around. But they also used traditional boats in local areas as well. Of course, being in the middle of the ocean, they relied very heavily on reef fish inside the lagoons, inside the fringing reefs or atolls in some cases, as well as pelagic fishes in the deeper waters. But they also relied on breadfruit and taro and other fruits and vegetables that grow on those Pacific Islands as a result of climates that are moderated by the ocean. Additionally, plants that grow in that kind of climate became the materials for construction of all kinds of kitchen utensils and plates and baskets and such. But they were one time use, throw away and they'll degrade and they'll re-nourish the, the soils. Same thing with construction materials. Um, structures were built out of um, natural materials, including um, large leaves and fiber made out of coconut twine. And again, if they were destroyed in storms or otherwise deteriorated, they could just be easily reconstructed. So that's their local, very quick history locally. But they, as were the Atlantic Islands, they were also heavily impacted by early explorers, early traders. Then with when our wars became so huge that they became global, these Pacific Islands became very strategic locations. And even today, they are seen as that way. And it's sort of like everybody's trying to put a claim or stake, even though we're not involved in a global war at the moment, putting a, a stake or a claim in these lands, partly for control, power, ownership. All of these issues come into play, and, and who gets the resources. So there's been this stamp of colonialism on this nation, and since the 1800s, Micronesia has actually been colonized or occupied by Spain, Germany, Japan, and the U.S. until they became independent in 1983. So some of the other characteristics of working in this environment, there's definitely island time. Every day is like another day and there's no hurry and clocks don't really count for much. The remoteness of and the isolation means that it's really hard to get materials in and out. It's expensive for people to travel there. It's expensive to get items there. They're based very strongly in an oral tradition, which means even though there are educated people and very smart people, I mean, and by educated, I mean formally educated, reading and writing is not their favorite thing. So to do long-term planning that relies on a record makes it very interesting. And then cultural priorities and strategies for solving internal conflicts and issues are based very much on a long history of social structure that um, don't always jive with what we think of in our legal systems. So all of that is working together. There are impacts of science and technology, which also means control as countries come in to island nations. They gift them with all sorts of wonderful things and then also expect things in, re in return. They've been impacted, like many nations, by missionaries of many, many faiths, and so Christianity is strong in that area. They also are now 
the caretakers of relics from world wars and other types of impact from non-island people. They are impacted by foodstuffs that were created and developed for war and become very reliant upon this, um, these very unhealthy foods and unhealthy activities. They also are impacted by sports, attitudes, behaviors, dress of people, not only people who are traveling there, but mediate uh, the media, gives them access to information, and they sort of take on some of the dress and the cool cat kinds of feelings. And all of these end up impacting the people of that area. The local foods have been traded for spam and the unhealthy foods. The construction materials have, these, these take a lot more time and care and effort and work and they have to be reconstructed and repaired. They've been overtaken by businesses and newer kinds of construction. The kitchen utensils that used to um, work with a throwaway society just fine have been replaced by styrofoam and plastics and other kinds of um, produced things that create enormous problems for an island nation that has to either export trash or they have to, it litters their island or they have to find and use quality high prime real estate um, land for trash dumps. Another thing that is impacted is the traditional Transportation has given way to our metal boats and cars and other vehicles that then become rust buckets. The ocean waters and climate create deterioration much faster than they do in other areas. And so all of these things create additional issues for them. And then when your world is totally salt water surrounding you, climate change is a new thing that is beginning to impact them. And so they are dealing with flooding, and it's periodic now, but how do they mitigate, plan for, to address these issues? So when salt water is your entire world, not only are you trying to preserve your, your cultural values and traditions, but you're trying to survive in a global economy and a global world. So how can they make the decisions that will benefit them as a small nation, but with a lot of power and probable ownership so that their children can survive long into the future. Thank you very much, Dr. Van der Stoop. And part of what this shows us is the importance of understanding the connection to our natural environments. In this instance, it was the ocean and the importance of the ocean and not giving up that connection and, and realizing that if we walk away from what sustained us at one point in time, we have problems going into the future. And, and this is an interesting challenge is how do you help people develop the way they want to develop and also give them some warnings about lessons from other parts of the world. And so if we think about where the United States and other countries have stepped in and said, let us help you move forward and not always left people in a position that they could do what they needed to do. I think that um, Dr. Van der Stoop's team is in an interesting position of, of how do you plan for the future with a community so that they wind up with what they want and not the bad parts of development and industrialization by whoever defines bad, you know, so that's, that's an interesting perspective. Um, and next we're going to have Dr. I Eva Cassens Knorr, who is an assistant professor of urban and transport planning in the School of Planning, Design, and Construction. She also holds a joint appointment with the Global and, Urb Urb Global and Urban Studies Program and has an adjunct appointment in the Department of Geography. And her research centers around resilience, sustainability, and large-scale planning projects that are triggered by global forces. And she's now starting to look at the effect of global climate change on island communities and how these communities can plan for cataclysmic events and, and try to preclude the catastrophe the best way they can. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you very much for coming. And in contrast to the speakers you've heard before, I'm at the very beginning of this research project. 
So I will raise a lot of questions of what islands will face and what we can do about it. The first thing I would like to look at or want you to look at is kind of the causes of what, where climate change is coming from. Basically, through the greenhouse gas emissions, we'll see increasing temperatures. And here, going back to the Pacific Islands, is a forecast of how much the temperature within the next century will rise. So we'll face between one and five degrees. And that will heavily, heavily impact on the sea levels we'll experience now and how much they will rise in the future. Here, for example, is the Caribbean islands, and at the current levels that we have, <coughs> due to the rising temperatures, you'll have um, the melting of large ice, cu ice caps and melting of glaciers, will, which will increase that sea level rise. And you can see here that large land masses will be starting to co be covered by the ocean. So what does that mean in particular for islands? Islands are very flat, so the, the rise, even the smallest rise in sea level, will immediately impact um, large population groups, which increasingly settle along the coast due to transportation issues. The next thing it does is, you see here a zone of dispersion between the freshwater and the saltwater. Freshwater is very, a very limited resource on islands, so you see that dispersion and you'll see the decrease in freshwater. Another important issue is the ocean acidification, where about 25% concurrently of CO2 gets absorbed by the oceans. And the effect has a huge impact on um, the coral reefs. Here you see, especially for um, the Caribbean, you see the yellow dots increasingly uh, have these coral bleaching. This is what it looks like right now, mm -hmm. where you can see that that will have a huge impact on the biosphere and biodiversity. My main research focuses on extreme events, looking at how extreme weather events, in particular hurricanes, impact these um, Caribbean nations. Here you see um, hurricanes only from the 2010 season, where you see the amount and basically the force of these hurricanes. I will f particularly focus in this presentation on Haiti and Port-au-Prince in particular, and how basically hurricanes heavily impact these islands through flooding and through earthquakes, for example, too. I am particularly interested in resilience. So we know, for example, that we have an increasing exposure to these climate change events that makes these islands in particular very vulnerable and so they have to react, what we would call adaptability. We have to increase our adaptability against it. If you look at an extreme event in Haiti, where you had in 2010 the strongest earthquake in about 200 years of magnitude of 7.0, and it was only 10 miles southwest of Port-au-Prince. The immediate reaction you saw across the world, you had large donations, you had immediate troops on the ground, and you had emergency help. Everyone wanted to help. So you looked at the news and you asked yourself several questions. One is, donations are not reaching the populations. They get trapped somewhere because it takes too much time. The next question you saw on the news was um, the personnel on the ground that was sent is endangered due to. There may be aftershocks, there might be riots on the ground. So how do we secure the ones that go to be safe and at the same time help? So the supplies were also not reaching doctors. Why was that? We didn't know exactly where the doctors were. We didn't have the means to get the donations to these doctors immediately. Local, lack of local leadership, another thing that was not expected because of the earthquake hit the epicenter of, um, of Port-au-Prince, a lot of local government buildings were destroyed and with it killed several local leaders. And finally, the spread of the infectious diseases, cholera broke out. Why was that? Very simple explanation. Fresh water was rare and so you had so many trigger effects coming from just one earthquake. One of the important things was the destroyed infrastructure. If you look at the highway on the right, how would you ever be able to reach the population groups that were in need of most help? 
These are um, the other pictures from a governmental building that was destroyed. The immediate response was riots, food scarcity. It was all predictable, but then again, what, what options did we have? And so one of the things was airdropping of food supplies. If you think back, you might have heard that these food supplies were dropped three days after the earthquake. Three days, because the government couldn't decide, or the people in charge couldn't decide, would it cause more problems, more crime among the population groups, or less. After three days, they, they decided we need military presence, we need helicopters to distribute that food, and we need more and more reliance on foreign aid. We needed also to get rid of the dead bodies, not to be rude, but they were causing more and more diseases in the, in the area. So as a planner, you look at temporary shelters. How do you protect the people from the aftershocks? As a planner, you also look at when do the temporary ones turn permanent? When do people make a permanent home out of what they had? How do you remove old buildings where you have a lot of memory? What does it do to the populations or communities that live there? Then we look at long-term planning. You have these short-term immediate responses, but they always have an impact on how you plan for the future and what remains behind. One is would you actually rebuild what was there before? It was good for the community, they relied on it. So would you ever build them exactly at the same spot or would you re relocate them to make them safer for the future? Would you replant crops and farms, local food supplies directly where it was before or would you move it more inland to make it safer? And looking at it, how is the resilience against a future extreme event? We know it's in a very vulnerable zone. We know it's going to get hit by, by a disaster in the future. So how do you make it more resilient? There was one planning alternative that came, the master plan of Port-au-Prince. And as you can see, if you just look at the intersection of um, the sea and the intersection of the land, you see that large strip of trees and water that now serves as a, as a buffer zone for future extreme events. So you see slowly there is change happening in Port-au-Prince that is trying to make that community more resilient. Resilient means bouncing back aftershock, but what you really want in the long term is sustainability. One of the key concepts that we as planners more and more talk about is how to ensure a working economy, how do you ensure the care for the environment, the natural protection, the mitigation of climate change or future climate change impacts, and especially how do you ensure social equity? How do you ensure access to food, water, housing for all, especially after so many people have been hit by the first shock of the earthquake and then the cholera outbreak. So finally, we're looking at, so what are the planning alternatives for the long term? What does sustainability planning for Haiti really mean? The number one thing we would always say is that you have to adhere to the local voices. What do they need? What does the community need on the ground from us planners? Is it relocation? If you look at the sea level rise in the next 100 years, especially on the coastal zone, how do you convince someone to move away from their home after such a disaster where you usually return to where you felt you had a community and support? Are you rebuilding or are you again relocating? Which types of buildings do you use? Where do you get the material from? How do you make it disaster resilient against, earth, against earthquakes, against any type of hurricane that might hit that city in the future? And more importantly, how do you ensure water safety so that a cholera outbreak like the one that happened in 2010 would not happen again? These are basically the questions I'm raising in my research. I thank you very much for your attentions, and um, I thank the panel also for introducing such a wonderful topic. Great, thank you very much. And when, when I think about what we just heard and think about the difficulties on, on the mainland, if you think about the continent, I mean, just think about the 1994 earthquake in the Los Angeles area, or think about the impact of Katrina and Rita in the Gulf area, and how slow we were to respond to the immediate needs. And there's mass infrastructure 
and there's lots of places that resources can come from. And how does that get exacerbated when you then talk about an island where it's not just the infrastructure within the island, but how do you get to the island from the outside world and the importance of thinking about planning? Um, one of the things that we really like to do with Sharper Focus Wider Lens is give the panelists kind of a chance to maybe ask each other questions based on what you've heard. And then we quickly turn to you to ensure that you get a chance to ask your questions and interact with the panelists. So I um, just want to quickly see if anyone had any comments or feedback based on what you heard from each other. I would actually like Masako to, to <laughs> express to the group more about the basaltic, the implications of the true um, seafloor. Under, yeah, the, the seafloor and implications for ownership, ownership and mineral rights and such. Oh, I see. Um, so. A few years ago, I think actually 2009, we had a, a first workshop um, amongst scientists who, whose main study is about so-called the mid-ocean ridge system where the uh, sea floor is formed. And associating with that for formation of the sea floor, um, as I showed in the slides, there is a uh, lot of uh, so-called the hydrothermal activities and where um, bio, um, a lot, um, how can I say, the extreme, like Nathaniel pointed out, extreme environment, extremely high temperature, acidic environment, but still a lot of organisms are living. So um, we think that that ecosystem almost mimic the early earth condition. So it's almost perfect environment for us to understand the origin of life. And we gathered together in 2009 at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, uh, inviting a few representatives from um, Papua New Guinea, where the Canadian uh, mining company called Notil, trying to uh, obtain the authorization to mine their seafloor. And like uh, Gail introduced, this is um, the local people in the Papua New Guinea wants to welcome Canadian mining company expecting they can drop a lot, they can gain a lot from Canadian company. And of course the Canadian company, for them it's mining resources right there. And um, building inf infrastructure in Papua New Guinea is, is extremely cheap compared to um, what they do off the Canadian shorelines. So they think it's mutual interest. However, scientists had to carefully assess, hold on, are you really okay to just start digging the seafloor, destroying all these ecosystems that should be important for our, for advancing our knowledge about where we are basically from, the origin of life, et cetera, et cetera. And my impression is that um, this seabed drilling, well, sorry, the seafloor mining activities will happen. I have been monitoring uh, so uh, a few uh, newsletters that is distributed by uh, marine mining companies and then communities, and they're all excited about um, such a such company got a permission from the United Nations Seabed Authority to dig out an Indian Ocean or in the middle of the Pacific. And there is no, um, nobody could say no right now for that permission and authorization. And that is a really interesting part of this activity. Well, I, I find it also quite interesting that the econo exclusive economic zone, which is 200 miles extending from coastlines, there are impacts to that related to climate change and changing coastline areas. Mm -hmm. There are then the difference between that and a potential set of new definitions that are not based yep. so much on surface distance with water column below, but based on the bathymetry 
at yes. the base and how might that be then looked at? And are there similar challenges in um, the Arctic? with yes. ownership issues. And w so with sea levels changing all over the place, our old definitions and concepts are going to change. And I can just see some interesting challenges ahead globally for negotiation. It's clear that the oceans are our next frontier. And we have to figure out how we deal with it. Um, are there questions from the audience? You want me to grab the microphone? Yes, please. Uh, I will run around with the microphone. Let me ask uh, just one while I'm running back here and see if I see, see a hand in the air, which is to you, Nathaniel, you mentioned that, I mean, how much can we understand what we're gonna face on the moons of, of Saturn or the, you know, uh, other, other uh, planets from the kind of stuff that you're looking at in those high uh, salinity kind of environments? Well, I think when you look for life on other planets or moons, you have to throw out everything you know and expect the unexpected. Uh, but I, I, there are some guiding rules which I think NASA has followed, uh, one of which is follow the water. Uh, mm -hmm. And water is such a phenomenal molecule. Uh, almost every element in the periodic table is dissolved in water, which means it's a great media to deliver nutrients to our cells. And so in many ways, people have a hard time believing life could exist without water, but equally they conclude that if there is water, there has to be life. So this is part of what's driving this expedition to, to Mars and, and the rovers. Um, the other though is to follow the energy, because we know that all of life captures chemical energy and somehow uses it. <coughs> and so if we look for molecules that can react in such a way to liberate a lot of energy, oxygen being one. Uh, hydrogen gas is actually another. It's a f it yields a lot of energy in microbial metabolism. And so we look for these key molecules and we might look for them being out of, equal, out of chemical equilibrium because life is very much a process that take things, takes chemistry out of equilibrium. Uh, so I think the things that we learn in an environment like Vida can really tell us you know, how to keep an open mind and what to really focus on when we look for chemical signatures in other planets. Great, okay, I'm coming over. I'm not sure this question falls into anybody's specific expertise, but as the Arctic Ocean becomes navigable, it, that's predicted, I believe, um, for at least part of, of every year, what would any of you have to say about the implications of that? Well, we're already, I, I remember when I was a teenager, there was the, the oil ship, the uh, super tanker, the Manhattan, does anybody remember that? that? That was going to blast its way through the Northwest Channel and to open it up so that they could transport oil, you know, from Alaska. And, you know, so this was a big deal. It was all in the news, and they actually had video footage of it in real time, and it got stuck, and it couldn't get through. Mm -hmm. uh, I think last year someone took a kayak through, uh, a sailboat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so the, the Arctic is really opening up. Uh, and we're seeing uh, the Russians are plant, have planted a flag on the North Pole on the bottom of the seafloor and you know, yes. claiming ownership of, of, the, of the seabed, which is somewhat questionable. The Canadians kind of laughed at it. <laughs> but there is, it gets into this question of the EEZ that the, there is a ridge that runs across or very close to the North Pole, the Lomonosov Ridge, and the Russians are arguing that it's part of their continental shelf, yes. that it extends from their continent, from their seafloor or seashore all the way across. And if so, they claim 200 nautical miles on either side, which would dramatically carve up the Arctic. And the U.S. is not arguing the point because off of Point Barrow, there's a whole there's a peninsula underwater that extends offshore, way offshore, and they're arguing that that's part of the continental shelf that sloughed off and broke, and that's really part of the continent, so we can claim our own 200 nautical miles around that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the Arctic is really changing. It, it's uh, it's going to be a very interesting place to study. <laughs> yeah, and that gets sort of back to my point in question to Masako earlier that the rules are changing because technology is changing, because climate is changing, because our concept 
is changing. So things that we thought we had settled are no longer settled and the different ways of claiming or planting a flag are changing and maybe one is because we made the first passage, whether it was in a little boat or whatever, we put the flag, we have the continental shelf, we have this and they could all be potentially legitimate claims, but it's going to take some really serious um, global negotiation, I think, and, and I think it's more serious. Now, th there used to be agreements in the polar areas for doing collaboration or, s or in research or having different research stations, but now when there's economic advantage by shorter transport routes or access to additional resources that have economic value, it really, it really changes the underlying motivation, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions that someone might have? Because I'm sure that some of us have lots of questions that we can, <laughs> that, let me, let me challenge uh, Peter. You know, I think that really what you laid out is the idea that somehow uh, it's, a, it's a different way of restating what Gail said, which is that our understandings of what constitute boundaries, I mean, when we draw the United States, normally we draw it you know, where there's something north of it and something south of it, but we, th we understand ourselves very much within that, within that boundary. And what really what you're laying out in terms of Atlantic world is that people didn't always look at it in exactly the same way. I mean, that, that nation states, it, those were very fungible kind of barriers and people were, were going all over the place, not unlike our Pacific Islanders, but really, the Atlantic world is understood, and people are going back and forth, up and down and across. Could you talk a little more about that in relation, maybe to, to what kind of effect it had on us, too, say, in, in, in this nation? Well, it's a, that's a big topic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think what Atlantic history has tried to stake out in terms of being a subfield within history is that very idea that, um, uh, just studying empires independently of one another doesn't get at very crucial questions. Um, if you look just, for example, at the slave trade, this was something that engaged and involved different empires and um, something that's very difficult to, to, to study but was rampant throughout most of Atlantic history is contraband trade that was carried out between different empires. and. Uh, had a huge impact on the development of the United States, for example. Um, one of the reasons why those um, New England merchants were um, so cantankerous when they started, to ha st started to having to pay taxes and obey actual British navigation laws was because they were engaged in contraband trade for a long time and were not wont to change those habits. So our very um, concepts of independence came out of um, traditions that weren't all that above board uh, if we were just to follow international law. That's just one example. There, there could be others, but uh, um, it's a much more interconnected world. People moved, uh, I think, much more freely than we think they did. Um, from place to place, not only not always because they wanted to, much of it was coercive, um, but nevertheless, it was uh, there was a lot of exchange going on as a result of this increase in trade across the Atlantic. Okay, other questions that folks have? Questions? I don't have it really formulated, but on this issue of um, seafloor mining and what it means about global power. Um, back in the 70s, you know, Global Reach came out and the whole issue of transnational corporations uh, and the, their growing power and the, there were some people who said there was a decrease in power of national governments. I don't really think that's so much the case, but it's, you know, the corporations obviously had an increase in power. You've got the multilateral institutions which of course are, are a place of struggle of the national governments, they're not separate. And then in the last decades, there really has been an increase in organizing civil society, but how can we get a handle on things? That, and the other um, 
dynamic is where science is not, um, you know, every, it, it is also in this um, uh, network of power, you know, the, science doesn't benefit everybody, you know, the people who have the most power can use it. <laughs> um, where, where strategically can we get a handle on it? <laughs> that is a big question, and then, to be frank, I don't know how to answer. Um, I really don't know. <laughs> hmm. Power, uh, science. Do you want me to take a stab? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I think so, yeah. I'll, I'll take a stab. Science is this interesting thing that scientists do their science and they get all these wonderful results and sometimes it's expressed into a, into a public venue, many times it's not or it's done in a way that isn't quite understood. But still, humans are humans and they make decisions based on value systems and priorities and that power thing. And science, scientists need to figure a way to use the science, not just to say, look you silly people, this is what the science is saying, why can't you believe it and respond appropriately? Because there is all that other stuff mixed up in that, and power is also a challenging thing to address. Is it power because it's economic power? Is it power because of military might? Is it power because of prior occupation? We see shifts over historic time in where power is held, and even within individual nations, there are different sources of power, like in Micronesia, there's the traditional power, that's not necessarily the elected power, but it's important. And Flipping a little bit, I wanted to turn, uh, flip this idea of power on its head a little bit, again with a Micronesian example. The boundaries might form the basis for economic decisions, but in, an, in a nation that is tiny in population, tiny in land mass, but huge in ocean water, in this case a place that is high biodiversity and is such a huge nursery area for pelagics, uh, um, and the pelagics are on the brink of real failure, yet the overfishing is not by the nation of Pompeii, or I mean Federated States of Micronesia or Pompeii, it's other nations that have the money with big equipment to come in and they have contracts that favor themselves and such. But can you think of a bold move, we'll use <laughs> our Michigan State um, bold move idea, of taking the boundary power of a small nation and say, can we save the pelagics for the world? And what kind of economic and other tools might we use to be able to protect this species? We're little, but we really maybe do have some other source of power that other nations don't. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very changeable thing. And, and do nations grab power? There's a couple of things. There's a power issue, and then there's the whole science decision-making human element in all kinds of decisions that are made. I don't know. Well, but to all of you, I mean, isn't the, isn't the problem that Gail's raising and that, um, um, that's been raised generally that we're a because we can society? You know, why are we mining the ocean floor? Because it's technologically possible. Why do we do the things in the Arctic? Because now we can, thing that, that we didn't before. There's no moral imperative in that. Should we do it is not the question. That we can do it becomes somehow operative. But, I mean, the fragility, the, the, you know, what I think, Nathaniel, what you're raising to a degree, is that there are real life consequences biologically to what's going on. Global climate change, many of those islands in Micronesia or elsewhere in the world will disappear when the oceans rise. People are already staking out land in India where they're planning on moving their entire island population. They're buying large tracts of India to be able to do that, you know. So that 
we know that things have consequences. So the question is, I think the, Chris was really raising a political question. How in the world do, do any of us take a stab at saying, just because you can doesn't mean you, can, you should? You know, and how do you take on that issue of what's happening in the Arctic or what's happening to Micronesia? Naturally, what happens with fishing rights scale, as you well know, is that people will keep on going in and fishing until gunboats keep them out. <laughs> you know, it, it, their ability to actually bring suit or to, to win in the world court and everything else is based on real live resources either military hardware on the one side or, or money for, for lawyers on the other. So how do you, you as a panel, this ocean stuff is very fragile as you've all laid out in different ways. How do we get a, how do we get a, a handle on that from what, what Chris was raising and what you're raising? Or should, or should we raise moral imperatives? You know, I was, I was gonna comment that, uh, you know, the Kyoto Protocol is what, 20 years old now? And we don't have uh, CO2 mitigation policy in the U.S. Can't, and California may have just started. Um, and so in many ways, scientists, we know the answers. Mm -hmm. We know what's going to happen, and we've been screaming at the top of our lungs about what is going to happen. I had a student write me uh, last month, said, oh gosh, you know, I took your class in oceanography, and you predicted the damage from Hurricane Sandy. And I'm like, oh, I wasn't the only one. I'm not even the smartest one who actually predicted it. And yet you find people in that scenario that want to move back and want to rebuild. Uh, somehow we have to transition our society from short-term thinking to long-term thinking. We can't have elections run on two-year, four-year cycles. I mean, we have to be thinking long-term. And quite frankly, I don't know how we do that. Uh, but I do like to, to actually uh, quote one of my students who came in one morning and he said, my gosh, we sent this tiny robotic um, rover to Mars with a laser that blasts rocks. We can do anything. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I absolutely think we can, but I, I'm looking ahead into the future. I do not see us mitigating CO2. Uh, there is enormous economic pressure to continue fracking, getting uh, petroleum, digging oil in the Arctic off the coast of Florida, Newfoundland's opening up a new series of, of drillings. Uh, and, and I just cannot see us any time in the near future regulating CO2, which means it's going to get a warm place very quickly. Mm -hmm. And a warm place is not going to be a comfortable one. Sea level rise we've talked about. We haven't talked about the fact that the frequency of intense rain events is going to go up from something like two or three a year in certain areas to 20 a year. We're going to have severe droughts, which we know cause uh, massive deaths in some cases in cities and, and, and areas. There's even predictions that the city of Las Vegas will be abandoned in our lifetime uh, because of a lack of water. And so I look at all these things and I go, it's not that hard to look into the future to predict what's going to happen. What is really hard for me to get around is why we can't change our mode of thinking and actually. I think I can answer, answer that. <laughs> So I think over time, the human race has very much learned to adapt. We use technology. Look at infectious diseases, we have vaccines now. Look at, we know the islands are going to disappear, so we buy land. So we're learning to adapt. That's what we've done our lifetime long. Now we have to understand that we cannot anymore. Right now we're using 50% more of the resources on Earth that we actually should. By 2050, we have, we are predicted to have nine billion people living on the planet. I think we as scientists have to push, get the word out that this is going to happen. This is not fiction anymore. And I would say we have to start with ourselves. We have to look at us very, very critically and take on that responsibility that we have as scientists to really move that forward and bring it on the public agenda. This is not a solution. <laughs> it's just naming the problem in a different way, I guess. I, I don't think we're a nation that does things because we can. We do things because we can make money from it. it yeah, and one of the reasons something like 50% of the population, the American population, 
doesn't believe climate change is anthropogenic is that the fossil fuel industry has waged a major pro, uh, program of disinformation. So, yeah, scientists, I admire you absolutely enormously, but the opposition is great. And I, my little uh, step was to decide um, to make a big fuss about this on my Facebook page. Um, I was thinking, I'm not going to change, I'm preaching to the choir to some extent, and I blocked out my um, <clears throat> implacable opponents. But I thought, there are young people in my family, and there are young people in my friends, and I can maybe light up some of them. I think it's, the problem of disinformation is really serious, and it's funded by very serious interests. There, oh, there are, I think, two big things. Short-term versus long-term thinking is one of the key factors that plays into human psyche, and I just forgot the other one. Um, never mind. You just go on. <laughs> um, there was oh, before you move on, I want to add something. Oh, okay. While I'm talking, probably Gail, you can remember. I'll, I'll okay, hopefully you're gonna click. I just wanted to raise um, one um, another question to ask or to be addressed. I usually um, ask this question in my classroom. Uh, it's it's related to the CO2 mitigation using the alternative energy, so called, mm -hmm. right? Um, we don't want to use the fossil fuel anymore. We don't want to burn those things because that just increases atmospheric CO2. Then, okay, what is the alternative energy? What is the alternative way to, for example, drive a car? I'm not just talking about this because we are in Michigan. I'm just talking about this as a global uh, context. So the way of thinking, we still want to drive a car instead of switching to the public transportation we each of us want to drive a car. Driving the car uh, using the gas would be bad, so let's switch to hybrid or electric. What this car use is the rechargeable lithium ion battery. To make this battery, we need a precious metal. That's why we are going for the seabed mining. What is the alternative energy? What is the you know, what's, what the alternative energy means if we are basically destroying the hidden, well, intangible or invisible uh, part of the earth, but still destroying it. So to me, I think um, the most important question to ask to ourselves is that, do we want to live a life like we have been doing for past 20, 30 years, or can we modify a little bit? You know, not to drive a car, either electric car or gas, or we don't use a paper towel as many as we use, we have used. Just uh, switching a little bit of our attitude would be a good start, I think. That's what I usually tell my student. I did remember okay. your story, <laughs> Halton. It was back to the information piece. The way we get information over, over the years has become increasingly in shorter bits and bytes and little short Twitters and things. And so in a mediated, mediated society, we've come to prefer our information in these little bits. Things are either black or white or hot or cold or right or wrong, and they're simplistic. They're not the complicated chain of events and all interrelated as the example that um, Masako just gave us. We don't think about that. We don't read the detailed stories. Certainly, probably, we don't always do that either. So you can imagine the general population probably is not looking at the complexities. Over to you, Cynthia. Oh, sorry. Yes. 
So one possible solutions, and it, it actually ties into the disinformation. If you think about, there's the individual level, and there's also the system level. And so if we're gonna take on the system level, and, and you could dissect that multiple ways, but if you take kind of the market, or government in either way, and I'll deal with government for a moment, and then you can see the corollary over to the market. Basically, the, the information that's out there, that scientists have, doesn't always make it to the decision makers, right? And so part of that is having someone that can translate. Not every scientist is going to take the step to make sure that the person that can make a decision related to their science has the information in a usable format. But there are organizations, whether they're advocacy organizations or policy organizations or a state agency that can get that access. And so it is incumbent on those of us that want to make a change to know what are the access points for legislators at the local, state, or federal level. And they don't all get information from the same sources. And so understanding that who you are tied to race, gender, ethnicity, the district you represent, it really influences who you're gonna to listen to for information. And taking more time to figure that out and then being the filter to get that information in at the front end. When, when Eva talked about setting the public agenda and being able to address it there. But then also coming back in when there are committee hearings. And, and so being proactive to say, I'm gonna take the information from Nathaniel, figure out how to make it usable and get it to legislator X because they're gonna listen to it and legislator Z never would, right? And understanding that it really takes that type of disaggregation. And at the business level, I mean, to the extent that we have young people following behind us, how we help them have a moral imperative that they can then take into industry, into business, into their shopping patterns will influence long term. So we didn't get here in five years, right? And while we want a tomorrow strategy, the tomorrow strategy really is plan for the future so 20 years from now they're not saying, what do we do? And so we start down the path with emboldening the people coming behind us to make the necessary steps and not being afraid of either the economic or the political system and, and taking them both on. Yes. So one of the things we want to do, he's orchestrating me from the floor in case you didn't catch that. <laughs> um, if there are no final questions, um, we thank you for your time today. We want to allow time in case you want to have some one-on-one -on -one conversation with the panelists. We want to ask you to keep an eye out for the next Sharper Focus Wider Lens this spring, which will be Food in the City. And we are very much looking forward to that. And we really appreciate your time here this evening. We appreciate all of our panelists. And we encourage you to keep the conversation going. Thank you very much.